Uh, I want us to stand on our feet because with the man of God in the house, I'm, I'm trying to limit myself so that we give sayake to ipatiane vizuri aweze kututumikia. Uh, Reverend um, Bishop Joe Bowa from Jesus Outreach uh, Church that is in Karura is a person I've listened to and especially in the field of leadership. I was telling him the time I felt he needs to come here I think it's about some years ago we were at uh, that uh, steam up. Yeah, we had a workshop there and I listened and I said, I, this is a man I would like to share with the, my people. That's the reason why this year, this is our final leaders and uh, pastors forum. We now close so that we project for 2023. So it's a very important meeting to this ministry and uh, we are ready for the word. Are we ready? Amen. And uh, these people, they are willing to hear whatever the Lord may tell you to guide us and to tell us. So from now, I'm giving you this pulpit. Feel free. Can we put our hands together as I bring the man of God? God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Amen. It is my first time to be here. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my friend and my brother, Bishop, and the First Lady for allowing me to be in this leaders conference. Uh, I want us to celebrate them in a great way. Put your hands together for your mom and for your dad in Jesus' name. Yes. Uh, I have known Bishop for quite uh, several years now. And uh, I also listened to him because... I preached before he preached on that day. And uh, uh, I said it is very, it is good that God made it possible for me to speak before him. Because if I spoke after him, then it would have been very tough for me. And usually God knows how to arrange things. And that is why uh, we met there and then we listened to one another and he has broken the ice that I have come here first. Then we are going to invite him to Karura to come and minister there in Jesus' name. Amen. God's time is the best. Please comfortably take your seats. And uh, tell your neighbor, welcome to Zion. <laughs> Again, tell them, welcome to Zion. Uh, as Bishop have said, I am Joseph Mbugwa from uh, Karura Kamurimo. You know there are two Karuras. There is Karura Kanyugu and there is Karura Kamurimo. I come from Kamurimo or Kadafuria, that's what they call it. Uh, but I don't look like that. It is only that I, I come from there. But I was born and brought up in Dimuru, where Bishop is working there. And uh, if I can just say this, Bishop, uh, I was telling my, 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 one of my leaders today uh, that uh, I used to be in Kenyogoli Primary School in Dimuru. And any time we were coming, for, we were going for games in Manguo Primary, and your school was coming, it was very difficult for us. You remember what I said the other time? Because your school was the only school that was, the students were able to speak in English. 
So all of us, we used to speak in Kikuyu. And even I started speaking in, in English when I was in, in high school, maybe in Form 3. So uh, it takes God even to stand here and speak to you in this foreign language. And if a man from Kenyogori Primary can be speaking to the leaders today, I want you to know there is hope for you. Look at your neighbor and say, there is hope for you. You know, we are the people who are taught English in Kikuyu, whereby they used to, the teacher is saying, is drawing a box on the board and say, enone box, enone gradi. So, you, you know, that, that is the, the, the background that I'm, I'm coming from. And I thank God because your background does not determine your future. And I want to tell every leader here, no matter where you came from, you can become something in the kingdom of God. And uh, for me to be here, it is just by the grace of God. We are the people that we, when we finished school, uh, I went to college, of course, I am, although I went to Kinyogori High School, it doesn't mean I did not go to college. I went to college. I am a graduate. But then it took a lot of God for me to be where I am. And I usually tell people, no matter how you were brought up, you can still rise to the top. I used to be employed in the flower farms in Tigoni. And the whole day, you are working on the flowers and you are getting paid eight shillings. And that was my, and I was, I had just graduated, there was no work. By the way, it is only that I have a small body. I hear that we are almost celebrating uh, the same anniversaries of marriage with Bishop. Uh, me, I got married in 1993, so that is about 29 years. So it's only the body that I have small, but uh, this body is carrying mega grace. <laughs> and, and I am about to share the grace with you in Jesus' name. You know, Paul was telling the, 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 the people of the, uh, is it the Colossians, and then he was telling, you know of the grace that was given me, not for myself, but for you. So he was saying, there is a grace that I carry, but this grace is not for me. It's not to help me, but it is to help you. So, in other words, Paul was a depot of grace, a station of grace that were releasing the grace to the men and the women of God that they may become what God intended for them to become. And that is why I'm here, because I am passionate about leadership. Very passionate about leadership. Because one thing that I have known, the strength of the leaders is the strength of the church. I'll say that again. The strength of the leaders is the strength of the church. If the leaders are strong, the church will be strong. If the leaders are weak, the church will be weak. If the leaders are prayerless, then the church will be prayerless. So you are the ones that determine the direction of the church. That is how powerful you are. Look at your neighbor and say, you are powerful. You know, I am trying to get the bearing bishop where to begin. But I've already begun. And I want you to know if you can inspire someone to be better, to do more, and to be more, then you are a leader. You are a leader. 
I know we have been told many definitions of leadership, of who a leader is, but I want you to know if you can be able to inspire someone to be more, to do more, to have more, then you are automatically a leader where you are. Let me begin by saying this. All of us, we are called by God and anointed by God that we may help the man of God, the bishop. Let me allow me to use uh, the, the title bishop to fulfill God's mandate because the mandate that we have in this ministry is a mandate that was given to the bishop and you have been chosen that you may help the bishop to fulfill the mandate of God. I know we have pastors here, but all the pastors are working under the bishop. So all of us minus none, we were called and anointed by God that we may assist and help the man of God to fulfill the mission that God gave him. I'll say this. There were two men by the name of Moses and Joshua. The Bible says that God called Moses. You know the story about the burning bush? In Exodus, I believe, chapter number 3, he called Moses and he gave him an assignment. And what was this assignment? To deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. Let me ask you. Did he do it? Yes. And he was supposed to take them to the land of Canaan. Let me ask you again. Did he take them to Canaan? Who took them to Canaan? Joshua. These are two men. One of them was Moses given the mandate by God to go to Egypt, deliver the children of Israel, and take them to Canaan. But he never made it. Let me ask you, who was more anointed than the other? Was Moses more anointed than Joshua or was Joshua more anointed than Moses? Of course, Moses was more anointed than Joshua. He used to see God face to face. You know, when, Mo when God was talking uh, to, to people like Miriam, he was saying, you people are not ashamed to speak the way you are speaking to Moses. This man, I speak to him face to face. When I want to speak to you, I speak to you through the prophet. But when I am speaking to Moses, I speak to him face to face. So Moses was anointed more than Joshua. But who finished the assignment that God had given him. So, it is not the anointing that makes a leader to fulfill the assignment of God. As much as the anointing is important, there is something else that is more important than your anointing. I know our bishop is anointed. But he cannot just use his anointing to fulfill the mandate of God. Moses was more anointed than Joshua, but he failed in his mission. Joshua was the one that succeeded in the mission. Ask me that, why. This was why Moses could not fulfill the mission that God had given him was because of the people that were surrounding him. Moses was surrounded by rebels. He was an anointed man. But the people that surrounded him, 
the leaders that were surrounding Moses, though he was anointed, they could not allow him to finish the mission that God had given him. Now look at Joshua. Joshua, he is less anointed, but he had people who were loyal, who were faithful, surrounding the anointing that he had. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse number 16. Uh, if you, uh, can we project that? Joshua chapter 1, verse number 16. Now, listen to this. This is what the Bible says. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. These are the people that were surrounding Joshua. They told Joshua, servant of God, whatever you tell us to do, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. That is the difference. Moses was surrounded by rebels, but Joshua was surrounded by loyal men. Simple. So no matter how a man is anointed, he needs men and women that are loyal and dependable to fulfill the mission that God has given him. Please look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are the one God is depending on for the fulfillment of the mandate of this ministry. And I'll tell all of you, if you can never be a successful number two, you can never be a successful number one. All of us are here. You know why we are here? Because God spoke to the bishop. He is the vision carrier. But we are the ones that are pushing the vision so that it can be accomplished. And I'll tell you, here and now, this ministry, I am trying to get the name Jesus New Life Ministries you know, it's just like ours. We are called Jesus Outreach Ministry. So we are the same. We are the Jesus Ministry. <laughs> and, and I want you to understand this ministry has one vision. And number two, it has one vision career. Please look at your neighbor and say, there is only one vision. And there is only one vision carrier. Because we don't want to confuse issues here. We know all of us, we have embraced the vision of the man of God and we are running with it. There is only one vision. I told my people, there is only one head, the vision carrier. Anything that has two heads is a monster. It's a monster. So there is one vision and one vision carrier. And for all of us, we are here to support the vision of the man of God. If you have your own vision, it must be swallowed by the main vision. Because you cannot be under the bishop and you are having your own vision. It is you take your vision, put it in the vision of the man of the vision of the man of God, and run with that vision. Therefore, every leader must serve well under the vision career. I'm speaking the way I would speak to my leaders. Ask them, 
I've taught these things. Uh, there is a, a, a message I was teaching. I taught about 17 teachings on if guidelines on effective kingdom service. And I talk like this. Because I've been in the ministry, I got now, uh, since I got born again, I celebrated 35 years of salvation in April this year. So I am not a boy in the ministry. And I know what its ministries. I've been in ministry for about 30 years, but a pastor for the last 18 and a half years. 18 and a half years. And I want you to know we must have leaders that are serving well. If you are going to be a leader and a successful one, you must be a leader that serves well. There is a man in the Bible in the book of uh, Second Kings is, is called Elisha. You know Elisha. We're not going to read many scriptures, but I'll mention because you people are leaders. Elisha served Elijah. And I want you to understand, Elisha was not a poor man. When he started serving Elijah, he was a millionaire. He had his own land. He was doing farming. And he had his own money. But he chose to follow a man. Leave his millions. Leave what he was doing. And he followed a man called Elijah. And, and according to Bible history, they say that Elijah served Elijah for over 20 years. It's not the way you, 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 you think that he served him for five years. No, it was according to Bible history, he served for over 20 years. And his CV, the CV of Elisha is contained in the second book of Kings, chapter 3 and verse 11. Please, let's read that. We are talking, uh, we are talking about serving well. Serving well. Now, hear this. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here? That we may inquire of the Lord by him. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. Who poured water on the hands of Elijah. That it was the CV of Elisha, the prophet. That for over 20 years, his work every day was to pour water on the hands of Elijah. When he wakes up, he requires water, he washes his hand. When he goes to the washroom, he is waiting for him outside there to wash his hands. That was the work of Elisha and carrying the bag of the man of God. For 20 years, he served faithfully. He served well. You know, one of the things that I have learned in the course of the ministry is that there are certain leaders that want to serve God in their own terms. But I want you to know, if you are going to serve God in the right way, you must serve him in his terms, not in your terms. In his terms, not in your terms. And Elisha, for over 20 years, he is serving the man of God, Elijah. And I'll tell you this, when Elijah was leaving, he asked Elisha, what would you want from me? And he said, I want the double portion of your spirit, not your anointing, of your spirit. There's a difference between the anointing and the spirit. And he was told, you've asked 
a difficult, a hard thing. But when you see me go, you receive it. And to cut the long story short, he received the double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Can I tell you this? He never received it because of prayer and fasting. <laughs> Please listen to this. He never received the double portion of a righteous spirit because he was prayerful or because he was a fasting man. He received the double portion of the spirit on the ticket of service. And I want to tell every leader here, there are certain things that require only service to receive them. He never prayed for it. He never fasted for it. What he did was serving the man and receiving the double portion of the spirit. His greatness was hidden in his service. Your greatness in this ministry is hidden in your service. In your service. There will be discouragers that will discourage you from serving. But you must stay focused. He was told, do you know, don't you know that your servant or your master Elijah will be taken away from you today? He told them, I know, shut up. We need people that will serve with focus that they will never be distracted from what God has called them to do. They will do it with focus. No matter what man says, you still continue doing what God called you to do. Because of what, one thing I want you to know, people will talk. As long as they have saliva in their mouth, they will talk. They will talk. And they will try to discourage you from doing what you are called to do and becoming what you are called to become. You know the difference between Jehazi and Elisha is because Elisha served well. But Jehazi served badly. He never served well. And what Jehazi was supposed to get was now double of what Elijah had. You know, they usually talk about the 14 miracles, I don't know, the 7 miracles of, of, of Elijah, 14 of Elijah. Now he was supposed to do 20. No, let me say this. If you serve well, you receive the grace that you are serving. You only receive grace by serving. <laughs> Can I put it in a better way? You only inherit grace by serving grace. Let me say this to you. It is better not to serve than not to serve well. Elisha served well, but Jehazi did not serve well. There's somebody who said that God does not bless what you do occasionally. God blesses what you do continually. And this is what Elisha did. He did it continually, not occasionally like Jehazi. But eventually he received. The double portion. Of the spirit of the man of God. I want you to look at the leader next to you and tell them you must purpose to serve well. 
I know I've spoken many things, but let's, let me go back now to the beginning. What God laid in my spirit. What is church? Church is a relationship between father and sons. I'll say that again. I'll qualify it. Church is a covenant relationship between father and sons. And the mark of a true church is when the followers are turned into sons. That's the mark of a true church. When the people who have been following, now they are no longer followers, but they are sons. And I came to tell every leader here, you must graduate from being a follower, a leader into becoming a son. Because the problem we are having in church today is because we have followers and we have leaders that are not sons. And I want you to understand, if you are a follower and not just a leader, there is no inheritance for you in this ministry. Because inheritance is only for sons. You may be a pastor anywhere, all over here we have pastors, all over, but I want you to understand, inheritance is just for sons. If you are a leader and you are not a son, there is no inheritance for you in this ministry. There is a difference between servants and sons. If you are just serving here, and you are not a son, then you have no inheritance. Servants receive gifts. Sons receive inheritance. So, please, let's have interaction. Ask your neighbor, are you a servant or are you a son? Because the problem we are having, Bishop, is because we have pastors under us that are not sons. They are servants. I will, let me tell you this. I came, I came anointed to step on toes. And I will step on toes until those servants and those followers become sons. Let me qualify. Let me, let me, now hear this. How, how many years did Elisha serve Elijah, as I told you? Over 20 years. We don't know exactly, but we hear it's over 20. He served who? Elijah. But can I, can I surprise you? He could not receive the double portion of the anointing as a servant. That is why when Elijah is taken by the whirlwind or by the, by the chariot, Elijah is crying, my father, my father. <laughs> there is nowhere else he has ever called Elijah father. He was a servant of Elijah. But at the end tale, he became a son. He's graduated from being a servant to a son to be able to inherit the double portion of the anointing. Because inheritance is only for sons. Elisha must graduate to be a son to receive the inheritance from a father. That is why there are many pastors who are under us, but they can never go far because they are servants. If you are going to inherit the grace that I carry, you must be a son. Is 
Is anybody being ministered to today? So what did I come to do? I came to graduate servants, leaders, followers into becoming sons. And it's not how long you have been serving that makes you a son. When you have the heart of God, you can be in the ministry for one year and become a true son. Now, again, ask your neighbor, neighbor, are you a servant or are you a son? You know why I'm saying this? Because if you are a servant, you are only working for yourself. If you are a son, you are working for your father and everything that belongs to your father. You know, sons know that the success of their father is their success. And sons know the failure of their father is their failure. They know the shame of their father is their shame. Therefore, they will do everything to see that the father is not failing. The father is not ashamed because they are sons. And that is what we are saying. We must become true sons. Lift up your hand and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, give me grace to become a son. Sons are dependable. Sons are loyal. Sons are trustworthy. Sons sacrifice to the success of their father because they understand whatever the father has belongs to them. Let me tell you this. If you are a son, you will not speak like that. Because you know, after all, Whatever the father has belongs. You know, sons will not conspire with others to set traps for their father. But servants can trap their father, their, their, their master. But sons can never conspire through sons. They can never conspire with others against their father. That is why we want everybody here to become a son. And let me say this. You discover your father. All of us must discover our father. You know, how do I put it? How do I put it? As you are following in a ministry, And as you follow the man of God, then you discover him as your father. And when you discover him, connect yourself to him. When I, you know some leaders, you are meeting Bishop, Bishop Makimei here at the, at the center. Hey, mo Bishop, you know. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. There must be. Sons have honor. And they understand that their standing is given them by their father. You know why you are a pastor? Because you have been given that privilege by the bishop.
Look at your neighbor and say, the going down of your father is your going down. You know, the Bible says in the book of First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 15, it's a, a scripture that we know very well, that you may, ha may have 10,000 instructors. Can we read that? For, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yes, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ, I have begotten you through the gospel. I'll tell you this. If you want to succeed in your ministry, acknowledge you are a son and you have a father. You know, I, I was thinking about when I was preparing to come, I was thinking about <clears throat> about the issue of sons. And, and I was saying ministry only grows where true sons are not opportunists. I'll say that again. Ministry only grows where they are true sons, not opportunists. I don't want you to ask your neighbor whether you are an opportunist because it might not go well. You might be sitting next to your wife and, and, and you, when you go home it might, it might cause issues. But I want you to know, you must graduate from being a follower, a leader, an opportunist to becoming a true son. And every true son carries the spirit of the father. I'll say that again. Every true son carries the spirit of the father. Every true son carries the voice of the father. When you hear them talk, you will hear their father talking. When you hear them talk, you will hear their father talking. You know, I, I'm, I'm usually challenged by the winner's chapel. I don't know, you, you know, I went to a meeting, I think it was in Moya, and I was, when I was parking the vehicle, I heard the voice of Bishop Oyedepo, and I was wondering, did, is he here? But I realized it was the son that was speaking in the tent. Not the, the biological son, the spiritual son in Kenya. And when he spoke, I heard Bishop Oyedepo. Every true son carries the voice of the father. And when I say the voice of the father, is what when they speak, you automatically hear the father speaking. Not the real voice we are talking about that they were already at, when our base. It's not the base I'm talking about. It is, you know, what is in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. So when we hear you, we hear what is in the heart of the man of God. Every true son carries the attitude of the father. You can't carry another man's attitude. If you belong to this house, then you must carry the attitude of your father. And I will say this, let me give you uh, the difference between the true sons and the fake sons. And please, you know where you are. When I give this to you, you will know where you are. 
Number one, true sons make commitments. Fake sons make promises. I don't know where you are. Number two, true sons have a dream for the ministry. But fake sons, they have schemes for the ministry. Number three, true sons are thermostats in the ministry. But fake sons are thermometers. You know what a thermometer is? It is to measure the temperature. So when they see the bishop, they want to measure, they, they want to measure how hot he is and how cold he is. They are always thermometers. But true sons, they are thermostats. They look for where the fire is to bring it down or to quench it. So please, can you look at your neighbor and say, are you a true son? Or are you a fake son? Number four, true sons seize the gain. But fake sons seize the pain. True sons, they see the gain. But fake sons, they see the pain. In whatever they are doing, true sons, they don't see the pain. They see the profit or the gain the, the ministry will get. But the fake sons, they only see the pain. They never see the gain. The bishop, I get at the two men I curu, then they go to the hill, they go to the hill, they don't see what they are going to gain with that. They only see the pain. True sons see possibilities, but fake sons, they see impossibilities. The last one. True sons say, I must do something. In this ministry, I must do something. Concerning this issue, I must do something. But fake sons, they say something must be done. Are you together? So, we are in this service to make every fake son here to become a true son. We are not leaving you behind. We want the leaders to be leaders who are sons. Servants to be, to be, to be, to graduate from being servants. To becoming sons in this ministry. We need people who can sacrifice. Sons can sacrifice. You know, the other day I was telling my leaders, I had a leader's breakfast, and, and I said, there are sons who are very true to their father, that they can do anything to defend their father. And you know, I asked them, and I also ask you this question, Bishop, when they went to get the money, what were they going to do? They went for prayer. But one of them had a sword. He went to prayer. But he is, he is holding a sword. It is still there. Why? Because they were ready to defend their father. I'm not saying you carry a sword. But you must. 
purpose that no matter what, I will defend my father because I am a true son. What is Peter doing with a sword in a prayer meeting? It's only because he values his father. He is a true son. There are people in my church who are very, I know them, they are true sons. And I told them, even if I am found being outside the gate, I am in Karura, and I am in Nakweru at the pasta near the middle of the metro, the metro, the metro, the metro, the metro, the They are ready to defend their pasta no matter what. Look at your neighbor and say, defend your father. Let me say this. The only place you have an inheritance is in your father. Your brother does not give inheritance. It only comes from your father. So if you find your brother who is wanting you to, to, to come together to fight your father, please run away from them. Run away from them. Run away from them. And as we continue serving God, let our service come from our love for God. Before we can become true sons, we must also have the love for God. That as we are serving God, we are not serving God from any other standpoint. We are serving God from the standpoint of our love for him. You know, when Jesus called the disciples, the Bible says he called them that they may be with him before he sends them. So the first thing was intimacy. Before ministry, intimacy. So before ministry, you must be intimate with your father. You must be intimate with God. That you may be able to succeed in the ministry. Somebody said that even when Peter cut the ear of the Roman soldier, because Jesus was a good father, he reached for the ear, put it back. And why he did that is to remove every evidence that Peter cut a ear. Even if he is taken to the court, there is no evidence. He will say, I was, my ear was chopped off. And then they will ask, which ear was chopped off? This one. Where was it chopped? There was no evidence. So a father is to cover your mistakes. There was no evidence. He cleared the evidence. So that is why you have a father. A father is a covering. Covering the sons. That they may be able to operate in the ministry. So you don't joke with fathers. You don't joke with sonship. Let's give God a mighty hand. You know, Bishop, I was doing some Bible study. I, I wanted to know. You know, I was worried because Isaac is going with his father in Genesis chapter 22. They are going. This is the father and the son. And they are going to Mount Moriah for a sacrifice. And reaches, reaches a point whereby the son asks the father, where is the sacrifice? I see the wood, I see the fire, I see the knife, but where is the sacrifice? And the father says, God will provide himself a lamb. But there's one thing I wanted to find out. How old 
was Isaac. And I was surprised. I always thought that Isaac was 17 years. He wasn't. The study I did, I saw Isaac was about 37 years. 37. 37 years. And now he has gone with the father. And when they reach there, the son is too obedient. When he is tired, he is just standing there. When he is being put on the altar, he is not complaining. And listen to this. When he comes out, when God provides a lamb, and by the way, let me tell you what happened. As they were climbing the mountain on one side with God, God with Abraham, God was climbing on the other side with a lamb. So when they reached the top, the guy was tied, he was put on the altar, but he did not scream, he did not argue. He was a faithful son. There are situations your father will put you into that you feel like screaming, but because you are a true son, you will not scream. Now, when he was removed from the altar and the lamb was gotten, he never complained to the father. He walked down with the father the mountain and he went home. He never even told the mother that this guy wanted to kill me. <laughs> Do you see a true son that, that believes in the father? Whatever the father says is what is supposed to be done. And that is what we want in this ministry. Let us become true sons. People will say, Jesus is on the cross. He's, he's in Gethsemane. He knows that he is about to die. But he is saying, Father, is it possible for this cup to pass? But not as my will, but as your will, as you will. A son that is submitted to the father. Do we have that today? People who will shelf their will to embrace the will of the father. All of us are candidates for the inheritance of grace. Please lift up your hand and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to become a true son. Don't work for a salary, work for an inheritance. You can only do that when you are a true son. I speak to every Elisha here. I know you have been serving for over 20 years, some 10 years, others 5. Now, become a son. My father, my father. then you will carry what your father carries. You know, the way some people are looking at me, you know, Bishop, I think, we will need many sessions so that we are able to ground all of you where you are supposed to be. I pray that God will give you the grace to become a true son in this ministry. Please bow your head.
I said, it's not how long you've been in church that makes you a true son. It is your heart for God. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. That Father, you will help each one of them to graduate to become a true son. That they will sacrifice for the vision. They will fight for the vision. They will defend the vision. That this ministry may go to the levels that you designed for it to go. Let there be a covenant relationship between the sons and the father. To the honor and to the glory of your holy name. Everybody shout a big amen. amen. I'll say this because I feel I don't want to speak again. I, I, what God told me to speak, I've spoken. But I want to say this. In the kingdom of God, there is what we call hierarchy. It is Joshua the servant of Moses, the servant of God. Listen to this. Joshua never heard the voice of God as long as Moses was alive. God only spoke to Joshua to tell him, Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. I've experienced that. You know, in this kingdom, there is hierarchy. You can never be above your father. You can never be. So we must come to a point when we become true sons, we maintain the honor of the Father. Am I speaking to somebody? Because what has eaten the church today is lack of honor to the fathers. Lack of honor to the fathers. And when I'm talking about fathers, I'm also talking to about our mom. Our mom also is your father. Both of them are your father. They carry the blessing, the inheritance that you require to succeed in that ministry. So may God grant you the grace to become true sons in this ministry. Last thing I want to tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor, neighbor, refuse to be a spiritual bastard. You know, a spiritual bastard is not somebody without a father. It's somebody who has refused to be fathered. Someone who has refused to be fathered. So as you go to 2023, let your ministry be different. As you honor the grace of your father, let that grace take you to higher heights. 
Let that grace open doors that you cannot open by yourself. Where there was struggle in your life, let that struggle be terminated. I'll tell you, my spiritual father is Bishop Thomas Mude of the Word of Faith Kiambu. For the last 30 years, he's been my spiritual father. I have not changed spiritual fathers. He's been my spiritual father for 30 years. And I tell you, one occasion came, I think last year, when we were supposed to go for lunch together. But I looked at myself, I said, who? Me go and sit on the same table with my spiritual father. I told my mom, my spiritual mom, it can never happen. It can never happen. So I did what I did and I said, mom, go take my dad somewhere. Because why am I saying this? Because I don't want familiarity. I don't want familiarity. Because he carries my destiny on his shoulders. You know, there are battles I don't fight. He already fought for me. You know, there are people who fight, have fought me in Karura. You know, Karura, I was, Karura is bad. But I also have a dangerous father. <laughs> you know, when we started church in the year 2004 there, they said in a meeting, Bishop, the meetings you people call for the parents, in the meeting of the parents, they said there is a man that started a church here and we hear he is called Bogua. He is sucking the blood of children. In the parents' meeting, Wangunyo primary, and they were told, be careful, parents, be careful, so that your children don't lose blood to that boy. And then I was being called a boy. And I thank God that that meeting said that. The following Sunday, almost half of the parents, they came to church because they have never seen somebody sucking blood. They wanted to see. <laughs> and when they came, I preached like a dying man, <laughs> prophet. And I, some of them, I called them by their names and I told them their problems and prayed for them and God delivered them. They never left. They are there up to today, some of them. So I usually, sometimes I ask, why can they come with something else so that people can come? You know why? Because I have a dangerous father that is covering me. You can never touch me. If you go without a covering, every nail will be run on your head. You will be beaten by rain. But as long as you are under the covering of a father. Did you hear this? The sons of Scepha, do you see what they did? Because they had no covering. The demons knew who the people who, are, who had covering. They knew them. But these ones, they were hit until they learned and knew that Jesus is Lord. So please remain under the covering of the Father and please Honor that grace. And you will go far. You will. Let me tell you this. I have told these people, they can tell you, uh, they can tell you, Dedan, Emmanuel, and Roland. I told them, if the, my spiritual father called and I was preaching, I'm on the altar, and the phone is brought to me, that is Bishop Mude, that is calling, I will put the microphone down. I will go on to my father. I will leave you saying the grace. It's your own problem. Because I know what it means. 
I knew what it means. I have told people, fathers are feathers. You can never fly without them. You can never fly without them. You can't. No matter how tall you are, you are still a son. You are still a son. My spiritual father and my biological father can cause me to put the microphone down and leave you saying the grace. I ran to them because I know what they mean for my destiny, for my life, and for everything that concerns me. May God help all of us that we remain true sons. And those that are no sons, those that are fake, and then God will bless your life. In Jesus' precious name.